Welcome to a fantastic edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. I'm here with Ross Buckley, who is a world-renowned researcher, the most downloaded on the Social Sciences Research Network, SSRN, which is pretty much everything and where every academic researcher needs to be to move their career forward. And Ross being number one globally is essentially a research celebrity. We are so excited to have him. Ross, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you, Alex. It's my pleasure. You're also obviously, uh, on top of being a fantastic researcher, you're also at KPMG Law and you're the King and Wood uh, Mallison's Professor of Disruptive Innovation at the University of New South Wales City, uh, yep. down in Australia, my uh, favorite country after America. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, very so, good. Uh, uh, so, our first question today is How old is the idea of fintech? And where did it start? Yeah, well, we wrote a paper about six or seven years ago in 2015, where we traced the evolution of fintech. And, you know, we could have taken it back to thousands of years BC, because, you know, the development of cuneiform writing, hieroglyphics, uh, allowed commodity futures contracts. You know, they've discovered clay tablets with commodities futures contracts on in them in the Tigris and Euphrates valleys. We could have taken it back that far. We could have taken it back to the abacus in China, which was essential to, you know, technology that was essential to finance. Eventually, we decided to take our analysis back 150 years to 1866. And the reason for that was that was the, when the first transatlantic telegraph cable was laid. And it was funny, in my former incarnation, before I got into fintech, I used to teach, you know, global finance and financial regulation. And we, I always taught the first period of financial globalization was 1866 to 1913, based on the statistics, but I didn't know why the starting date was the starting date. The starting date was because a telegraph cable linked the two financial centers of New York and London. And that it really spurred the movement of money around the world. So you know, our analysis takes it back 150 years, but it's a very long standing phenomenon. And no, over in America, during our Civil War, the telegraph yeah, at the later stages of the war was just in test as Lincoln had done it a little bit, but it wasn't really in mainstream use. And so you know, obviously in 1866, hooking up New York and London opened a whole new financial world. Yeah, absolutely. And technology and finance, or if you think about it, it's Finance is probably the, the most globalized commodity. Money is the most globalized commodity. And it moves in response to information that comes in over a computer screen. And it moves in response to messages inputted into a computer screen. So there is this incredible tie-in between technology and finance today. It's been there a long time, but it's um, today it's, I would say the, well, I mean, financial firms have been the biggest investors in IT for about the last 25 years. Before that, it was defense, but for the last 20 years, at least, it's been finance that's invested in information technology more than any other sector. Mm. I'd be curious what would have happened to the tulip bubble had there been the telegram then and US and London investors could have you know, invested, obviously, I guess it would, it would have just been a, a quicker situation. It would have you know, maybe happened uh, faster and, and blown up faster. Yeah. And it might have enabled people to see it was a bubble faster too right you know, it's it's hard to know but yeah it's finance and technology are just two things like bacon and eggs you know vodka and caviar they just go together well no. and they have for a long time so what periods or eras have you broken the evolution of fintech up into this is where it gets interesting i think at least from our point of view the first era was 100 years from basically 1866 to 1966 and that was an analog era. Digitalization hadn't really happened. But in the 60s, 50s and 60s, lots of significant things started to happen. I think um, Diners Club was 1950. American Express was maybe 58. Um, the Barclays inv invented the first ATM machine in the mid 60s. Texas Instruments invented the held, held, handheld financial calculator in the sort of mid to late 60s. NASDAQ came online in 1971. So that period around the 1960s, technology started to surge forward. And so our first period is the century from the laying of the telegraph cable. The next period is the 40 years from um, you know, 1967 to sort of 2008, basically. 
And that period is a period in which the same players are largely involved. So it's the, it's the major banks up until 2008 that are, that are using the technology, but the process is one of digitalization. So a lot of stuff that was done in analog ways, you know, up until the 1960s, increasingly once we get into the 70s and 80s is being done digitally. And you see that the middle of that period from uh, 1967 to 2008 is 1987, which was the Black Monday crash. I'm so old, I was work working on Wall Street then. And um, that was largely attributed to program trade. So computers, you know, generating trade. So by halfway through that second 40 year period, computers had already made a big, you know, inroads into financial markets. Equally, I was on Wall Street when Bosky was let off in handcuffs you know, by the DA. And that was his insider trading was worked out by computers, you know, running over, you know, noticing stock trades before public announcements. So, you know, computers. Hey, 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 hey. Sorry? Uh, I've been boasting oh. to my aunt, funnily enough. Oh, really? <laughs> You're more famous than I had realized, Alex. No, no. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you call that famous, but uh, no, my. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> But, uh, and then I suppose, so that gets us up to sort of 2008. And then, of course, the world changed with the global financial crisis. And it particularly changed for fintech because the bank's reputation took a hammer, right? And there was an interesting study done in America in 2015. A sample size, so a sizable sample of people were asked, who do you trust more to manage your money, your current bank? Or I think it was Google or Amazon. And about 70% of Americans in 2015 trusted Google or Amazon to manage their money more than they trusted their bank. So, uh, and they were so surprised by those studies, they repeated them and they got the same results with a different sample of people. So the banking sector took this incredible reputational hit in 2008, and that sort of opened up the um, potential for fintechs, startups to come in and start to provide financial services because the legacy effect was much diminished. There was also other things. The credit was tightened up after the, all the, all the uh, regulation after 2008 tightened the credit up a lot, which created opportunities for new credit providers. There were a lot of financial services professionals out of jobs looking for jobs. They moved into fintechs. There was a lot of things. But by our analysis, 2008 represented the sort of the next step change in the process. Do you see long as a kind of a important marker where algorithms weren't advanced enough, but were already able to run huge sums of money? So just give me, I missed the beginning of that. Give me the beginning of the question. LTCM, do you see yeah. that as a relevant kind of data point in the evolution of FinTech as kind of a fund that could achieve a lot of capital, but was using rather puerile algorithms? Or do you kind of? Uh... Yeah, no, we do. And we, we, our paper comments on long-term capital management. It also comments on the sort of danger, the, the weaknesses that exposed in value at risk models. You know, all of those models back in those days were, as you say, very, very underdeveloped. And there was a yeah. tremendous yeah. amount of hype. So it was only, it was really early days. And I, I think, what you see in our evolution is the first period is 100 years, second period is 40 years, the third period is 2008 to 2020, so 12 years. And this makes sense because technological change builds on itself, right? It's the nature of technological change that it just keeps getting more and more rapid. If you plot it on a graph, it's a graph going up, you know, fairly horizontal and starts to trend towards the vertical. So we would expect the periods of change to get shorter. And the amount, as you, especially given what Rebellion does, you know better than anybody, the algorithms have become so much more sophisticated in the 12 or 13 years since that stuff happened. Oh, uh, uh, it's amazing how times have changed. You look at the 2008 sell-off and it took longer than the COVID sell-off. You know, whereas now right. everything just moves much more quickly. It's the nature of technology, I think. You know, it's, it's the other thing that happened just was 2007 was the first smartphone. The iPhone came out in 2007. So that has, I think modern younger people underestimate how just how connected we are, and how unconnected we 
were, you know, before having computers in our pockets. So everything just happens much more quickly because, you know, human expectations as to how long a response will take has changed dramatically during the course of my career. So we should expect more volatility. Sorry? What's we should that? expect more volatility. Abs absolutely, I think we should expect more volatility and we should expect more change. I'm just going to plug some headphones in. Expect more change. I'd expect more change more quickly. But um, pause for one second. So we're seeing a more volatile world, and we're going to see change occur a lot more quickly. So we should expect stock movements to continue to get more and more wonky, and you know, be less smooth, if you will. I would. I would certainly think so yes i mean the counter argument would be with the better flow of information the market will be more fully informed so there's two ways to look at it but i suspect it'll be more volatility but how much of the market equation includes passion which as hobbes obviously says is irrational and so if you have a major irrational input you're going to have an irrational action i mean with, with boeing max you had so much irrational data that the Plane went all over the place. And with the stock market, you have fundamental rational economic data, but then you have this gigantic input of passionate uh, input, which drives numbers all over the place. You're right back to Keynes animal spirits, right? And an awful lot of investing wouldn't be done without passion you know, especially an awful lot of entrepreneurial activity. I mean, I think a lot of entrepreneurs with a certain amount of money would be, if they were being completely clear eyed about it, would would not invest it in the things they're driven by passion to, to try and pursue goals. And it's really important for humanity that they are. You're right, even with Elon Musk, he wanted to build an electric car. He wanted to go to school. Yeah. And so yeah. his wants, you know, uh, were met with success. So yes. what about regulators? Is it going to be a much tougher situation, do you think, or will it be easier with technology and fintech? Where, where do you see their jobs coming, coming to play here? could go either way for regulators, you know, it, at the moment, it's much harder, you know, it's really becoming very financial regulation. My favorite example is Yui Bao in China, which means hidden treasure in Chinese, you know, Ali pa Alibaba, Jack Ma, noticed that there are people were using, leaving money in their Alipay accounts, they'd buy something on Alibaba, Alipay was the, you know, payment mechanism, but they weren't taking the money out, they were leaving it there. So he decided to set up a money market fund. So they could do something with the money and earn a return on it. China had a very repressed financial system, very low interest rates. In nine months, Yui Bao became the fourth largest money market fund in the world. So, you know, Vanguard, Fidelity, the big American ones had been around for 50 years. And in nine months, it was of the same scale as them. When I did this presentation to the financial regulator in Australia, it was like you'd plugged electricity into the, into the chair of, of, of ASIC. He suddenly it was a, to a big panel, but he suddenly, like he had electricity flowing through him. Because if you're, an elect, you're a regulator, you've got something that doesn't exist. And in under a year, you've got something of systemic significance in your financial landscape. The rate of change, People's Bank of China got scared. They put the brakes on it for a while, but when they released the brakes off it, it quickly went to the largest money market fund in the world. So that rate of change is incredibly challenging for regulators. The flip side is if the regulators would use, were, would be empowered to use the technology through reg tech, through you know, AI scanning the markets, they could do a much more sophisticated job, many orders of magnitude more sophisticated than they are now. Um, but typically they're not being funded to do that. So Andy Haldane was the chief economist of the Bank of England. He gave a wonderful speech in I think 2014, where he said, I have a vision. It involves a, a Star Trek chair and a bank of monitors. And somebody is sitting in the Star Trek chair, looking at the entire bank of monitors and seeing in real time, the British economy playing out in front of them and red, green and yellow lights indicate where there are risks, risks building up. And he was too polite to say he saw himself sitting in the chair, but clearly he, he thinks of himself as William Shatner. But uh, that is the potential, right? The US Fed receives this 
document every day by from systemically important banks that takes a team of about 40 people to fill in and it's an incredible amount of information about each bank and it has to be up to date as of 5 p.m the day before yesterday um, you know it's an extraordinary treasure trove of information but nothing is done with it at the moment it's filed and used to mount a court case if something goes wrong all that information could be being processed by RegTech, could be informing regulatory decisions in real time. But to do that, the regulators would have to be funded on a level they're not funded at the moment. So it could, could be either way. So hopefully we will fund our regulators to have a smoother markets, to have a smoother economy, to, you know, to pop bubbles before they become serious. Yes. serious I mean, that, that's the, the hope in the future. Uh, do you see crypto as a, a bubble or do you have an opinion on crypto? I do. I think a lot of crypto is a bubble. A lot of Bitcoin is a bubble because it doesn't have a strong use case. You know, it, it's a speculative investment. It's useful for moving money to avoid taxes, you know, or criminal sanctions, but that's about it. So I think Bitcoin is very much a speculative bubble. Some the crypto that's built into operating systems like Ether and Ethereum, where you can build smart contracts and it's the payment mechanism for those smart contracts, that has a much stronger use case. And some cryptocurrencies fulfill important functions. You know, for instance, at the moment, the international sanctions on Afghanistan are producing terrible human suffering in right. Afghanistan. And cryptocurrencies are allowing ways for money to be transferred from abroad so that people in Afghanistan can eat. So that's a really important function of crypto. So there is a very legitimate side to it, but the great majority of the activity in the market is purely speculative, I think. Thank you for that. I'm actually running a research project with a few students on Afghanistan's economy uh, post US pullout. So. Interesting. It's a pretty ugly story at the moment. A very yes. ugly story, but it, yeah. it's a story that needs to be told. So yes, uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, so uh, this in is any story, when you have parents selling their children so that they can eat, is a story that needs to be told. <laughs> sadly, no, no, no. It's uh, it's uh, human rights atrocities left and right. Yeah. So as yeah. we near the end of this uh, episode, Ross, is there a technology you're very excited about for 2022? Do you have any feelings about what will define this year? Not so much this year. The thing that I'm excited about at the moment is central bank digital currencies. Um, you know, I think as at the moment, we only have them in relatively, you know, less important places like Nigeria, you know, Cambodia, uh, the Bahamas. But China is making big strides forward with its ECNY. And I think central bank digital currencies will reshape the entire international financial architecture in time. And I think what will happen is that China will release the ECNY in time, I'm not talking this year, maybe three or four years, for use in international trade. They'll subsidize it, it'll be very affordable. Once they do that, other major economies will have to respond with their own digital currencies. Otherwise, the data associated with that trade will end up in Beijing and Shanghai. And that won't be acceptable to DC or Australia or anywhere else. So I see a huge change coming. And it's, it's a fundamental rearrangement of the nature of money in a way. So it's going to need a lot of very careful, deep thought. But it's going to happen because China is going to make it happen. Fantastic uh, conversation, Ross. Uh, super brilliant. And I will continue to follow your research and learn from you. And I, I really thank you for the time that you gave us today. Thank you, Alex. Happy to come back whenever you like. Pleasure is all mine. Have a great day.